All right. So our next sub topic is 1.2 systems and models. Um, so this is less of an environmental topic, but um, it's really important in terms of understanding a lot of the terminologies in the way that we understand things within this course. Um, obviously, this is environmental systems and societies. So this whole subtopic goes over the, the concept of systems and what a system is, um, how, why we use systems. Um, often systems are, are drawn or um, diagrammed in a model. And then we can talk a little bit about the uh, benefits and drawbacks of, of using modeling. Uh, so this is definitely a lecture where if you don't understand something, um, don't just forget about it and move on because these systems terminologies are going to show up um, over the next two years. Um, and I, I think it's pretty straightforward, but please um, write down uh, questions uh, when we come back as a group. All right, so obviously we'll start with uh, what a system is. A system is a, a approach to learning that helps us visualize complex interactions within environmental science. And so um, looking at this course from a system standpoint, it's just a, a different way to view the world and the, the parts of that, that make the world, the, the interactions, the complexities. Um, that's basically how this course approaches learning. Um, models are simplified versions of reality. A model is something that helps us understand a complex system. Um, you guys probably already use models, whether you realize it or not. Like this drawing uh, on the right of this slide is a model. It's a model that um, oversimplifies how the tree interacts with the sun and with uh, water and carbon dioxide. Um, it shows where things are coming from and where things are going. Um, so it, it, you may think of it as just a drawing, but that's actually a model and it simplifies, simplifies this really complex uh, entity. Um, so a system in general is an interdependent components performing a function connected through some sort of transfer, whether it's energy or matter. Um, it's a little bit complex definition. You don't need to write that down. Um, just think of a bicycle as a system. A bicycle is obviously a organized, complex connection of components that all basically serve a role. They're all connected in some way, whether it's physical or through the, the force of motion. Um, but a, a bicycle is clearly a system that could be modeled. You could show the transfer of energies from pushing the pedal to the rotational energy of the tire. Um, you could show how the different parts fit together. Um, you can show what happens when that system breaks down. Um, so uh, you can think of a bike as a pretty uh, complex system. Um, there's few different ways to view systems, and we'll, we'll stick with that bike analogy. So the first one is a reductionist approach. That would be studying each individual part. Um, so if you wanted to study a bicycle from a reductionist standpoint, um, you would study the brake pad and you would study the spokes on the wheels and you would study the aerodynamics of the seat post and all the individual components but in this class we really take a step back and we look at the whole bike from a, a, a broad view we look at that holistic approach we basically look at you know we're less concerned about the the pedal of the bike and the handlebar and what the tire is made out of but we're more concerned about the big picture um, what is a bike and, and what are the benefits of it? What are the drawbacks of it? Um, how does it work? Um, you can also think of this as a really good comparison between biology and environmental science. I'm sure a lot of you are in biology class. Um, so you are going to be looking at a reductionist approach of biological systems. You're going to look at the very details of how the endocrine system works. You're going to look at the details of how um, a plant uh, turns carbon dioxide into glucose step by step. But again, in this class, we're looking less at those details and much more at the big picture, holistically speaking. Well,
Um, one of the original holistic approaches to environmental systems came from James Lovelock, um, a scientist in the late 70s, and he came up with the uh, Gaia hypothesis. Basically, the, the concept that the Earth functions as a single living system. Um, you know, he understands that the Earth is obviously not literally one living system, but that um, it basically operates um, as a life force. Um, and that really was the beginning of the concept of biosphere, the idea of, of all the living components of Earth. Um, and again, this is not something that a biologist would look at. They're going to be looking much more detailed at the individual living systems and even the parts within those systems. But in environmental science, we are looking really, really big picture, um, much more from that holistic standpoint. So there's three types of systems that you need to know. Um, the definitions, you need to know the differences between them. The first and most common system is an open system. This is uh, some sort of system. And again, a system can be a hummingbird, a tree, a classroom, um, a city, a country, almost anything can be a system. Um, but something that exchanges matter and energy with its surroundings. Uh, the human body, clearly um, matter and energy uh, enter our body, uh, matter and energy leave our body, so we would be considered an open system. Same with a farm, same with an ecosystem. Um, soil would be a, a open system. Again, most things I can think of, most systems I think of would be open. Closed system is going to exchange energy, but not matter. Um, the best example of this is planet Earth. Um, we get energy from the sun and energy in the form of heat leaves the planet, but materials do not enter or leave our planet. Um, all the materials that are on planet Earth, all the water, all the carbon, all the minerals, um, they stay here on planet Earth. Um, so because we exchange energy with outer space, but we do not exchange matter, um, that means that we're a closed system. Uh, technically, uh, when an asteroid or comet hits the Earth, as they do from time to time, that would momentarily make the Earth a open system. Um, but I would think of the Earth 99% of the time as a closed system, not exchanging matter without, with outside forces. Um, there's an interesting experiment called Biosphere 2, where um, scientists basically tried to recreate planet Earth as a closed system. Um, it did not go well. It did not uh, uh, last as long as they thought. But um, if you're interested, Google, check out some YouTube videos of Biosphere 2. I believe it was like a clear dome in Arizona that was set up to try to mimic the, the closed system of, of planet Earth. Um, but again, it was a, a, a failed experiment for the most part. But we learned a lot from it. Yeah, they ran out of oxygen a lot of time. They couldn't quite figure out, um, you know, even though plants provide oxygen, they couldn't quite balance the amount of oxygen that the scientists who were living in the system uh, were using and then the, how much the plants were producing. Um, they were running low on food, things like that. Um, I don't know if you guys saw The Martian, uh, but that movie kind of shows Matt Damon trying to recreate a closed system um, in his little greenhouse in Mars. Uh, last but not least, an isolated system. An isolated system means that it never exchanges matter or energy. It's basically um, completely, not just closed in terms of materials, but isolated, no exchange whatsoever. Um, there's not too many real world examples of this. Um, the only example I can think of is the universe. Um, and even that is not totally clear because I don't know if scientists fully understand what is beyond the universe. Um, but as far as we know, the universe makes up everything, so the universe does not exchange material or energy with anything else. Um, maybe in a laboratory setting, scientists could recreate isolated systems. But for the most part, uh, almost all systems are going to be open or closed. Most are open, some are closed, uh, pretty much nothing is isolated. Okay, so what makes up a system? Um, you got to understand these six terms. Um, how we draw them, um, how we utilize them in this class. Inputs and outputs, storages and flows, and then lastly, transfers and transformations.
as far as drawing system diagrams goes, um, it's pretty straightforward. The storage of the diagram, um, which is the, the holder of the energy or matter, uh, is simply a box. And then the flows, which are energy or materials coming in or energy or materials going out, are simply drawn using arrows. Um, arrows pointed towards the box is an input. Arrows leaving the box is an output. I understand that this right here seems pretty straightforward, but um, common mistakes that students make, um, sometimes students draw a circle. Um, I get that that's another way to draw a systems diagram, but according to IBESS, that is incorrect. Uh, the systems diagram is a box. Um, some students draw a picture. If I tell you to make a systems diagram of a cat, um, you need to draw a rectangle and write the word cat inside of there. If you draw a wonderful picture of a cat, that is wrong. And then the biggest mistake is with the uh, flows is students often draw a straight line from like an input and then they draw a line to the storage, but you, you do need that arrow. You do need to show, you know, if it's just a line, I don't know if it's an input or an output, so you need to show an arrow of where um, that energy or material is going. Um, you simply label the process on the arrow, um, and then that's kind of it. Um, I'll get into transfer and transformation in a second, but um, you know, as easy as that sounds, you just learn five terms, storage, flow, input, output, process. And then you already know uh, open, closed, or isolated. A transfer is simply a change in location. So think about the water cycle for this one. Um, water falling out of the sky and hitting the ground, seeping underground into an underground aquifer, um, going from the aquifer into the ocean. Those are all transfers. It simply changes in location. Uh, a transformation is a change in state or a change in product. So again, um, when that water hits the ocean and then evaporates back into a cloud, that would be a transformation. When it condenses into a cloud back into water, that would be a transformation. Um, when it precipitates from the cloud onto Earth, that would just be a transfer because it's just changing location. Uh, so here's an example of a systems diagram. Uh, unfortunately, this student would lose one point because they should have drawn a box and the word fish in there. Um, but besides that, we clearly see the inputs uh, going in, whether it is um, a type of material or a type of energy. And then we see the outputs leaving. Uh, so this would be an example of a open system diagram. These are all examples of systems. Um, again, almost anything can be viewed uh, from a system standpoint. Um, obviously, we'll be getting into some of these systems, such as an ecosystem, um, in a lot more detail. Our entire next unit, um, topic two, our longest unit of the whole course, uh, is on ecosystems. So we're going to be looking at um, the details, but also the, the big picture of what goes in, what comes out, how things change, um, different materials and energy that are stored uh, within an ecosystem. Um, I don't think you need to write that down. We'll get into uh, the details of ecosystems in our next unit. Um, but it is you know, something that can be modeled, where we see the flow of energy, and we see the constant recycling of matter. All right, if we're looking at a um, hydrologic system, um, you should be able to look at this and identify inputs, outputs, transfers, and transformations. And let's end with review. You should be able to make this chart uh, or this table and pretty easily uh, answer yes or no to the following six questions. Okay, so that's it for 1.2. Again, 1.2 is pretty light on environmental content, but in terms of the importance of it, um, those terms you just learned are going to be used over and over again um, throughout this course. All right, now 1.3, again, is less uh, detailed on environmental knowledge, but sort of background information about energy, equilibria, 
um, how things shift and move and change in more of a physical realm. Um, and, and, and again, these things are going to sort of come up throughout units uh, in the course. So we start with the laws of thermodynamics. Um, hopefully this is review from last year. The first law of thermodynamic is that energy is neither created nor destroyed. This is simply known as the conservation of energy. So whether we're looking at a open or closed system, we, we need to understand that energy, all the energy in the universe um, has really always been there. It simply just changes form. Um, it can be uh, uh, lost towards entropy. It can be conserved. It can be uh, transformed, but it's, it's always going to be somewhere. Um, and in terms of how this matters on Earth, all energy, almost all energy on Earth, originates from the sun. I mean, if you think about all the energy we get in our food, that all came from photosynthesis. Even if we're getting energy from eating a hamburger, um, that cow got energy from grass, and that grass got its energy from the sun. Um, even the gasoline that I put in my car, that gasoline comes from a fossil fuel, which is um, millions of years old, uh, decomposing material and whether it's a dinosaur or a tree or whatever um, if it was a living thing it means that the origin of that energy came from the Sun um, even think all the energy in your body is solar powered which is pretty cool to think about indirectly of course but everything you've ever eaten um, originally came from energy in the Sun the one uh, uh, exception to this rule is the heat from the middle of the earth that geothermal energy from within the earth is not solar that would be the, really the only energy on earth that's not directly uh from the sun. again we look at all these transfers of energy um burning a piece of coal um to convert chemical energy into thermal energy we um boil the water to turn the turbine the turning turbine spins the generator the generator produces electricity so when you plug in your iphone um, you might not realize well how is this bad for the environment why do people say not to waste electricity um realize that in michigan we get our energy from coal so if we're um watching tv or running the air condition or, or using appliances it means that more coal is being burned into the atmosphere and it's all those um transfers of energy um, that conservation of energy from the piece of coal all the way to our iPhone or our air conditioner. Um, just going into a little more detail, that first law, um, all that sunlight that reaches the earth, the majority of it um, hits earth and gets turned into heat. Um, a lot of it hits the ocean. 30% um, actually doesn't even get to us. It gets reflected back into space. Um, a really small amount is used for photosynthesis. So it's pretty incredible to think all the power we get from the sun, how valuable that is. Okay, now the second law of thermodynamics um, I already alluded to. And just so you guys know, we only uh, care about the first two laws in this class. Um, we don't really learn about the third law um, and almost no one learns about the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Um, fun fact, there are four laws of thermodynamics. The first, the second, the third, and the zeroth. Uh, anyway, second law. When energy is transferred, some energy is always lost as heat. So if we think of the amount of energy in that piece of coal versus the amount of energy that we get at our house, um, it's not the same. A lot of that energy is lost throughout the process of conversion. Um, what that means is that if you look at, say, a top predator, um, indirectly a mountain lion gets its energy from the sun but the sun gives energy to the plant the plant gives energy to the rabbit the rabbit gets energy to the um mountain lion every step along the process we're losing a lot of that energy towards inefficiencies um it makes sense why there's more grass than rabbits and there's more rabbits than mountain lions uh anything that lives on the top of the food chain there's simply less available energy for those creatures so think about um, a lot of our rare species on earth like sharks and tigers and um, cheetahs and lions these are often top predators and there's there's naturally going to be less than them plus things like poaching and, and hunting and things like that will take a toll 
Um, again, we see a caterpillar eats 200 joules of energy. A lot of that is lost. Some of it is conserved and then that'll go up the food chain to whatever eats this caterpillar. We see um, what I just talked about with the, the levels of hierarchy. And we'll get into this more in our ecology. Talked a little bit about this, the piece of coal all the way to your house. Um, you're losing a lot of that energy every time it converts from the chemical energy inside the piece of coal to the heat, to the pressure, to the electricity, it's always being lost. Okay, and then I'd say this is the, um, maybe the most, uh, not important, but maybe uh, most intriguing concept of 1.3, and this, this idea of equilibrium. So equilibrium is the tendency of a system to return to its original state following a disturbance. Um, equilibrium is generally speaking a good thing, Think of a rubber band. A uh, rubber band has a really resilient equilibrium. Um, I could wear a rubber band around on my wrist all day and stretch it, and then at the end of the day, I take it off my wrist and it'll go back to its original shape. Um, sometimes equilibrium can be lost. If I wore a rubber band around my head all day, um, I don't know if it would go back. It, it might That equilibrium might be destroyed at that point. Um, Usually, open systems on Earth, so things like uh, uh, an ocean or an ecosystem or a farm, they tend to exist in some state of equilibrium, um, but there's three types of equilibrium. All right, so just like there's three types of systems, there's three types of equilibrium. Um, static equilibrium is pretty unrealistic, similar to an isolated system. A, a system that never leaves equilibrium will be considered static. And again, on planet Earth, with changes in weather and climate and seasons and um, things like disease or uh, hurricane, you know, things change. And so a static equilibrium is pretty unrealistic. Um, stable equilibrium, also known as steady state equilibrium. So you need to understand those two terms are synonymous. These are systems that return to the original equilibrium after some sort of a disturbance. Think of a healthy ecosystem for this. So we have a forest here and there's a forest fire and now the forest is changed, but fast forward 30 years and that forest should look the way or look similar to how it was before the forest fire. Um, and then unstable equilibrium is when a system changes to some new sort of equilibrium after a disturbance. Um, so again, think of that same forest. If that forest maybe wasn't as resilient and there's a forest fire, that system changes um, and it might not go back. And now that forest might be a grassland. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it's now at a new equilibrium and it's maybe never going to get back to that original um, forest. Uh, a great example of this is climate change, where um, you know we are seeing new equilibriums arise. We're seeing that, the, you know, the new average temperature, the new average number of droughts in a year, the new average number of mosquito-borne illnesses are simply different than they were decades ago. And a lot of that is due to um, the unstable equilibrium that is caused by climate change. Um, go ahead and draw all three of these diagrams because I think these are pretty helpful. Um, you could draw them on the same graph and color code them, um, but I would definitely uh, understand that uh, static equilibrium never changes state. A, uh, sorry, a stable equilibrium, also known as steady state equilibrium, um, is hit by a disturbance, but then it recovers. And then an unstable equilibrium is going to be hit by a disturbance and then it'll reach some new type of equilibrium. Um, nice way to visualize in terms of stable equilibrium, think about a grape in a bowl. Um, if you shake that bowl or if you nudge that grape or even push that grape up the side of the bowl, um, there might be some disturbances, but it will level out and get back to the middle of the bowl. Um, in unstable equilibrium, flip that bowl upside down, put the grape <coughs> on top, and notice that any small nudge 
um, one little disease, one little forest fire, one disturbance um, could alter the state of that grape forever. And it's not easily going to get back to that original spot. It might never get back to that original spot. Okay, and then um, last part of content for this unit is the idea of tipping points. And this is um, connected to the concept of equilibrium. Um, a tipping point is the minimum amount of change within a system that will destabilize that system, creating a new equilibrium or some new sort of steady state. So think back to that um, bowl with the grape on top. Um, the smallest amount of touch that causes that grape to tumble off and reach some new equilibrium, that is considered a tipping point. And we often hear this in terms of um, climate issues, but also environmental issues in general. We think when it comes to species extinction, what's the tipping point? What is the minimum amount of change that's going to spiral out of control? What's the minimum amount of disturbance that is going to lead to some sort of chain reaction or some new normal, some new sort of um, equilibrium? Um, if you've heard the term, the straw that broke the camel's back, that refers to tipping points. Um, okay, what I want to do right now is uh, pause or minimize or uh, shift this screen over and um, you are going to do a three minute research assignment. Um, obviously you don't need to explain this right now because we're doing these notes solo, um, but pick two of these issues um, and basically simplify how it is a tipping point. So just type in Amazon rainforest deforestation tipping point or forest fires in United States tipping point desertification of China tipping point and the idea is I just want you guys to think of this in terms of this system what is the cause or what is that nudge that is turning China into a desert where it may not be able to go back um, what is the nudge of the Greenland ice sheet that could cause this tipping point that that disallows it to come back to what it was before that. Um, so again, these are um, considered named examples. You'll notice in this class, we often rely on named examples. So um, uh, even though this is red, it's red because I don't need you to write all this down, but um, I do want you guys to know this for 1.3. Um, you don't need to know all seven examples, but you do need to know a couple named examples of real world tipping points. So again, pick two of these quick research, simplification, and just jot it down in your notes. Okay, and then last bit, I, th I think I've said this is the last thing a couple times, but the I think this is the last, last part of 1.3, and it's this idea of uh, feedback. Feedback is a process or energy or matter that changes a system in some way, um, and feedback can be positive, meaning it encourages the change, or it can be negative, meaning it discourages a change. Um, these terms are actually a bit confusing because they tend, they're, they're opposite of what they sound like, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, a negative feedback loop is something that limits the effects and helps return to stability, meaning if there's some sort of disturbance, negative feedback will help return that system to what it was before the disturbance. Um, there's a good example of this with predator-prey relationships, like um, if there's uh, mountain lions and rabbits, and there's a lot of mountain lions, that means that um, there's not gonna be very many rabbits. But then if there's not many rabbits, the mountain lion population, they don't have anything to eat, so their population will shrink. But now that there's not a lot of mountain lions, the rabbit population will grow. But now that there's a lot of rabbits, the mountain lion population will grow as well. And then what happens is you get what's called a predator-prey cycle, also known as a negative feedback loop. Probably an easier example of this is human body temperature. Your, the human body temperature is a perfect example of negative feedback loop. Um, when you get hot, you sweat, and that helps you cool down back to normal. When you get cold, you shiver and burn more calories, and that helps you heat up back to normal. 
Um, if we didn't have this feedback loop, we would just get too hot and pass out or get too cold and die. Um, but luckily, the human body has these feedback loops where if we're too hot, we can cool back down. If we're too cold, we can warm back up. Now, positive feedback is the amplification of a change that leads to further change. It's sort of like a um, chain reaction or like a, a runaway train situation. Basically, it's when something happens that causes the original thing to happen, that causes that thing to happen worse and worse and worse, or more and more and more. Um, let me use forest fires and global temps as an example. Um, okay, uh, temperatures are getting warmer on Earth. That means that there's going to be more forest fires. Um, so that's the disturbance. But then when forests burn, that releases a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. And CO2 actually is a greenhouse gas, and that's going to make temperatures even warmer. So then the temperatures get even warmer, and that causes even more forests to burn. That releases even more CO2. That causes temperatures to get even warmer. That leads to even more forest burning. That releases even more CO2, which is going to lead to even warmer temperatures. And notice that it's the opposite of human body temperature. Human body temperature goes up, negative feedback brings it down. Uh, with positive feedback, warmer planet causes fires. That causes an even warmer planet. That causes even more fires. That causes an even warmer planet. And things sort of spiral out of control. So notice that it's, a, it's, it's the opposite. Um, positive feedback is, is, is something that's going to go away from equilibrium. Negative feedback is going to stay at equilibrium or return to equilibrium. Um, two examples. A stampede is an example of positive feedback. Cows start running, other cows panic, more cows run, more cows panic, more running, more panic, more run, and then that leads to a stampede. Body temperature, I already talked about, that is a negative feedback. Um, this will help you when it comes time to studying. Um, positive feedback loops are almost always bad, and negative feedback loops are almost always good. So. Keep that in mind, it's sort of the opposite of what it sounds like. I know that can be confusing. All right, that is it for 1.3. Um, hopefully you guys jotted down some notes. If you had questions, I'm happy to discuss and explain uh, whatever I need to back in class. Okay, bye.